Welcome to the Adam Does Movies podcast. It's Monday's episode and I'm talking movie tropes. That's right, I've watched movies long enough now. Well, I mean, you don't even have to watch them that long to pick up on some of the generic things we see over and over again. That said, I've been in the business for a while. I've picked up on a lot of things that seem very similar throughout films, whether it's a cat jumping out of a cupboard and scaring people in a horror flick, or the super genius that knows everything about everyone all the time, the hacker that can break into any security vault in under a minute. It's all been done to death, Sometimes it works well in the film, other times you just kind of roll your eyes. It feels more like a crutch that movies and scripts tend to rely on. Before we jump into it, I want to point out that the podcast goes out every single Monday at 8 a.m., maybe 9 a.m., I don't know, I changed it a little bit, but it's in the morning. Now, though, I'm happy to say that I do live shows every single Tuesday and every single Friday on my channel, Adam Does Movies, on YouTube. I've recently just started porting those over to Spotify, Apple, and other podcast services. There is video versions available too on Spotify. I know you can do videos uh, for sure, but that's kind of exciting. So you may have noticed that a couple extra episodes have been cropping up. Those are going to go out on Spotify, Apple, and the other podcasting services Monday for the, the, the real podcast, and then Thursday and Saturday will be the live shows. That's where I'm live on YouTube. I'm, I'm talking to the audience. I also have some fun topics I, I deliver on. Those usually run from anywhere between an hour to three hours, depending on what's going on, what the topic is, if I have a guest on. Um, yeah, so that's something to look forward to. Uh, like I said, there's already a couple there. And moving forward, that's going to be the norm. I'll try to put those up in the mornings as well because I know people like to listen to this on their way to work or, uh, you know, why they're still trying to get out of bed for the day. It, I, don't, I don't know your life. I don't know your life, dude, but I'm doing my best to, to give you some material. As a movie lover, it's nice to have some shared ideas, some shared conversation. And so let's get into 10 movie tropes that I think we all share as well. Again, there's way more than what I put on here, but these are the ones that really stand out. And the first one, which I already alluded to, is the good old-fashioned jump scare. I recently watched A Haunting in Venice, and there was probably five in that movie alone. The jump scare kind of is formatted in a couple different ways. But basically what happens every single time is you have something wildly out of place jump in front of the screen, jump in front of the person followed or accompanied, I should say, by a really loud, jarring noise. Just a, a quick hit of an instrument, a boom, or a dun-dun, a double beat maybe. Uh, the cat trope is really one that's been around for a long time because these, these fuckers can come out of everywhere and anywhere. They'll open a pantry door, meow, cat goes by, ah, loud music. A window is open, they start to shut it, and then meow, cat flies out. Uh, there's a super cut of jump scares. A, a few of these on here you can find on YouTube. There's super cuts of them. They're pretty fun to watch. I saw a super cat, uh, super, <laughs> super cat, I saw a super cat cut of super jump scares of cats. Now, it, it's, um, it's a fun trope, but it's very overused. The cat thing or the animal in general is just one way that the jump scare is utilized. We also have the friend of the main character who just slowly and awkwardly comes up behind them, usually in a dark room while they're already on edge, and they'll just like touch him on the shoulder. Hey, Mary. <laughs> and then they put that obnoxious loud music in as well. Hey, Jeff. Dan! Oh, oh my God, what? <laughs> or the skeleton hand falls down on them. There's always something that falls out of nowhere. It's really just things that you don't expect to, to take place, right? That, that's why it's a jump scare. I don't think it ever really happens in real life. <laughs> Again, unless a person's hide around the corner intentionally trying to scare you, I can't really think of more than maybe one or two times where I've legitimately been like, oh God, because a, a loud noise bangs in another room or something and catches you off guard. But it's never presented the way they are in the movies. The second thing I have on here, so that's jump scares. 
That's the jump scare. I, I did take notes. I'm just looking over to see if there's anything else. Oh, yes. The loud vehicle. I forgot about that. Uh, a person's on edge again. They're outside. And out of nowhere, a semi-truck drives by going 1,000 miles an hour. And you just see the... And almost hits the person. Oh, my God. Maybe don't stand next to the fucking road if you don't want to get jump scared by a car going by fast. That's actually going to transition beautifully and seamlessly to the next one on my list which is a person getting hit by a fast-moving vehicle, traditionally a bus, occasionally a delivery truck, rarely a car, but it happened. Well, actually, a car happens a lot. I did note some of them. Kick-Ass, I just watched with my son. I've seen it before, but I, you know, I wanted to go back to it. It still holds up pretty well. There, someone does get hit by a car in that one, unbeknownst to them. It comes out of nowhere. Dawn of the Dead I have on the list. Meet Joe Black is a two-for-fun. Joe Black walks out onto the road, gets double teamed by cars, gets hit one way, loses his freaking shoes, gets hit the other way. It, it's Looney Tunes levels of uh, disaster going on there. Mean Girls has a giant bus. It, 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 it's just ridiculous. I even put down pretty much every dramatic TV show at one point or another has someone get hit by a bus. Lost, bus, Buffy, bus, Supernatural. Probably multiple buses. That show went on for a long time. There's probably buses hitting buses in Supernatural. Did you see that bus? It came out of nowhere and hit my bus. It happens. It happens. Uh, I pointed out there's a YouTube supercut of this one as well. 13 minutes long of people getting hit by vehicle supercuts. You know, it's one thing if the car is driven by someone who's drunk. And they veer off the curb and hit the person in their yard. It could happen. It would be still incredibly rare, but that would make for an interesting movie moment. It's another thing, and this is the thing that happens in almost all the movies, where the person's in an argument or they're distracted and they find themselves in the middle of the road. <laughs> and then just boom. And it's not only they're in the middle of the road. They're in the middle of the road that's pretty much dead silent except for one car that's going 100 miles an hour and you don't hear it approaching until it's right there. It's just silent, silent, silent. And they're gone. Hilarious. Uh, this isn't one that's on my list, but I just thought of it. And it's a little harder to, dis to explain, especially in an audio format. But essentially, it's a shot that I saw very popularized in the early 2000s and it, I still see it trickle in once in a while but it's basically the point of view of the driver so you're looking you're looking at a side profile of the driver but beyond them so you can see the passenger window of the car and through that passenger window a car is approaching going 90 miles an hour and it t-bones the vehicle so the person's driving, la la la, minding their own business, and out of nowhere, this car just smashes into them. But it's that one shot that I've seen probably a dozen times where you're looking out that passenger window at the car coming at it. It's a cool shot, to be sure. It's a cool shot. But I feel like that's the type of shot that was, that was so well done, it probably shouldn't be replicated because it was a unique shot. It seems unfair to kind of copy it. But, you know, it, you copy because you're inspired. You copy because you're throwing some appreciation towards it, I guess. So that's maybe that's fair. All right. Next up, I have the classic catchphrase of dear God or oh my God. You see this in basically every single disaster movie ever made. There's always a general, a president, a scientist... They figure out something on the computer or they find out there's only four minutes left until humanity's wiped out. And every single time, you can set your watch to it, the person looks up, dear God, or oh my God. It's one thing to use it in a comical way, which you see in comedies often where it's like, oh my God, or dear God. But no, I'm talking more the serious films. I noted that it's in Independence Day probably five times. It's in Hellboy. It's in Harry Potter. It's in Men in Black, X-Men, Panic Room, female Ghostbuster 2016 movie several times because the writing's just so impeccably well done in that, that yeah, they say, oh my God, a couple times in it. The Dear God though is just, it, it's so good. 
every single time. No one says this in real life the way they do in movies. Person's looking at the radar. Pew, pew. We got several bogeys coming in. How many guys do we have up there, Johnson? We have seven, sir. Wait, no. Five, sir. Wait, no. We have one left. Dear God. Get him out of there! That's the other one. I love that one. Get him out of there! That's, that's good. That's good shit. The whole, the whole team's under attack. Pull back! Get him out of there! you love to hear it. The Hacker. I brought this one up in the opening. <laughs> this entire character is a trope. It, it's essentially a parody of itself. You have the typically slender, unconventional looking character, has a lot of piercings or tattoos, wears black, girl with the dragon tattoo-esque, really kind of made that its own thing. This person comes into pretty much every single situation and is really a walking deus ex machina on themselves. They can plug in their comically small computer. It's never a normal size laptop. It's always much smaller and sleeker. It's usually rugged because they've been taking it with them everywhere. They plug it in via USB and just one fucking time. I want them to hassle with that. I want them to have a hard time plugging that USB into the port. Because it's 2023 and yes, USB-C still ex it does exist quite, quite abundantly now. But there are still plenty of computers that rely on the USB where you have one side that can go in right and the other side is wrong. So you go back and forth constantly. This is a tried and true formula that always fails to work. You could be a thousand percent confident that you have it lined up the right way and it's wrong. I just want to see that in a movie. An expert hacker comes in. All right. How much time do I have to get into the Pentagon? Pentagon, three minutes. All right. Misses the first time and then just adjusts. Just like he just does like a, oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Did it ever happen to you? Uh, anyway, I'm in. I'm in. The vault is open. Go ahead. Get the money or whatever we're doing. What are we doing in this? It doesn't matter. I already got it. I, I hacked into everything. The, the street lights no longer are operational. The chemical plant down the road. I have opened all the reserves and the water is spilling out. Um, I have hacked into Fort Knox. I have hacked into the White House. I have all cell phones under my control now. Every single satellite in the sky is under my command because I plugged a hard drive in and for some reason that did things. I have one of those little uh, money pots. You don't know what a money pot is? Well, I just made that term up for this movie and now it's going to be a thing that gets used in several more movies going forward. Yeah, it's a money pot. <laughs> I love hackers. They get out of every single situation with it. Hey, Riz, can you patch me through into the... Yeah, it's already done. It's already done. Why don't you give me a challenge, Freeman? Okay, well, you see that bogey over there? Oh, you mean the one that I already deactivated is falling down and exploding? <laughs> Child's play. Love the hacker. One last thing about the hacker is anybody that's done any coding or use the terminal on a computer knows that it's about as bare bones boring basic as it gets. A terminal is a black screen. You can change it to white. You can change some of the, the looks of it, but it's basically just a blank canvas with really boring text with code. In some movies, my favorite is Die Hard 4. The interface for this hacker is so state-of-the-art and futuristic and, and like customizable, it's laughable. It, it's just everything is super slick and he's basically moving shit around with his hands. He's one step away from doing that. I find that funny too. Like it's a custom UI terminal. All right, moving on. No one watches where they're driving. Another car cliche. There's You could probably do a top 10 movie car cliches and tropes. This one has been parodied on TikTok and YouTube Shorts and stuff. It's, it's almost at the point where it's lame to even point it out. The basic plot is this. People have a conversation in a car. Driver's almost never looking at the road. I feel like the directors at this point are trolling the audience by seeing how much they can get away with. Guy will look for four seconds at the road talking about, uh, you know, his dad dying of cancer. And then he'll look over longingly into his wife or girlfriend's eyes for what feels like 20 seconds straight. Meanwhile, he's hit two skateboarders. You know what? You know what it is? 
I think a lot of Hollywood screenwriters truly believe that people are this horrible at driving. That's why when they film this stuff, the driver's never looking at the road. And then that leads to the other trope where people are constantly getting hit by cars because <laughs> they're not watching where they're going. It's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle that affects both parties, the driver and the, the person that's about to die. The bystander, the pedestrian, I guess is the, the technical term if we're going to get technical here. Yeah, that, that, that trope is a bit frustrating at times, but I'm not going to spend more time on it than I need to. Again, everybody knows this one. People, do, This one's a little bit more special to me. I feel like I'm more annoyed about this than most. People don't say goodbye when they hang up the phone. One that immediately jumps out, because I just watched it not that long ago, and I know it's in a bunch of other movies, is in Die Hard 1. Easily the, the greatest Die Hard movie and maybe one of the best action movies ever made still to this day. Mrs. McLean, uh, or Gennaro, Holly Gennaro, if we want to go by that. She's talking to Paulina, the nanny back home, and she's having a nice chat with her, talks to the kids a little bit, and this conversation ends like this. Thanks, Paulina. I don't know what I would do without you. Hangs up. That's not a goodbye. That's far from a goodbye. That's maybe the start of a new conversation. As far as Paulina knows, is there a raise coming through on the other end of this phone? This is during the holidays. This is Christmas. It's very possible Holly is going to give her a raise. Or say, why don't you take the rest of the day off? Or the weekend. Not, not the day, obviously. They're not at home. She has to be with the kids. But what, what does that sound like on Paulina's end? I don't know what you, I don't know what I would do without you, Paulina. Oh, thank you, Mrs. M Hello, Mrs. McLean. H hello. Just hangs up. It's rude. It's incredibly rude. And it's not just that movie. There's so many movies, especially when a dude's talking like a like a strong alpha male. He's on the phone, and he, he's like, "I want you to drop the money off over here, and then you're gonna meet me at this location at 3 p.m." Hangs up. That's all the information he gives to the other party. And the guy's like, um, <clears throat> where the fuck is that? What? What am I doing? Do, can I get an address? Can I get something? There's just no closure to some of these conversations. And it, it, it bothers me. It really does. I feel for the person on the other end of that line. Amazing meals that no one eats. First one that jumped to my mind when I put this down is Kevin McAllister in Home Alone. In the first film, he prepares probably the best looking mac and cheese dish I've ever seen in my life. Puts it down, gets the napkin, he's got the silverware out, I believe he has a nice glass of milk there ready to drink, and then he leaves it. He abandons it on the table, doesn't take a single bite, it's just sitting there mocking me, taunting me. But this is most noticeable in morning breakfast scenarios, there will be a family around the dinner table, uh, around the kitchen table. Typically, it's just the dad reading the paper, the mom still slaving away. She has a four course breakfast out pancakes, waffles. Why you need both? I don't know, but they're there. Cereal boxes, eggs, bacon, sausage. This woman's been slaving away for an hour or two to get this done. She's got a pitcher of orange juice in a fancy dish. She has milk on the table. There's fruit platters, not just an open thing of strawberries, not just a little dish, a platter presented with orange, mango, strawberry, grapes, and not grapes pulled apart, grapes off the vine, ready to be fed with you like you're a god. <clears throat> and these kids are like, I'm late for school, and they grab a Pop-Tart and they're out the door. What is, what is she doing with all this breakfast, and why did she think it was a good idea to make it? Does she know her kids? They're never up on time. They're going to miss the bus. Yeah, the, the food trope is, is a tough one. At the breakfast table especially, I notice it. My voice keeps getting deeper. <clears throat> it's like I need some water, but I got to push through. Okay, we got the amazing food no one eats. One last ride slash retirement. This is a fun one. I like this trope. Essentially, you have the old dog. And you got the new, the new blood, the rookie that's coming in. He's fresh. He's hot. Think Seven with Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt. Think um, Falling Down. The cop's last day of retirement. 
And who do we got? We got Michael Douglas fucking things up downtown. And now Robert Duvall has to get off his ass. It was supposed to be a nice, like, easy way out. He's going to go home and retire, but he has to do one last, one last mission, one last ride. The last rides have been coming up so much more lately because we have all of these legacy film properties where we can't let them die. So Indiana Jones is back for one last ride. He's, he's out of retirement to go on another adventure. John McClane probably would have gone on a sixth one if Bruce Willis was able. Lethal Weapon supposedly is still in the works with Glover and Gibson coming back for one last ride. I feel like number four already had him on that last ride. But then again, I feel like Indiana Jones already had him there too. Back in the Last Crusade, hence the title, Last Crusade. But we've seen this with legacy characters over and over again. And with the uh, just the old dog trope. They're on the beat one more time. They've seen it all. This is where we retire. But nope, someone comes out of the woodwork. It's always the most insane threat they've ever witnessed before. It, of course, leads to some fun interaction, some good storytelling. So it's it's one of the good tropes for me. I'm okay with it. I'm all right with this one. Surviving an insane crash. This, again, kind of falls into the whole car saga that we've really built up on this episode of, <laughs> of Hollywood writers thinking that everyone is an absolute shit show behind the wheel of a car. And I know they, they're in California. It probably is kind of nightmare fuel over there. And I'm in South Carolina now. And oh my gosh. Dear God. Oh my God. Look at I'm doing it. I'm doing the tropes. Though I just, I was waiting for a cat to jump out at me. Uh, the way people drive here is, it's bedlam. It's insanity. I feel like I am putting my life on the line every time I go to get a thing of milk at the store. It's, it's, you just don't know what you're going to get. But surviving an insane crash is something we've seen so many times. Hell, Suicide Squad has three plane crashes or helicopter crashes alone. And every time, these people just walk out. Nothing happened. No injuries. Not even a scratch on the arm. Just, yep, that just happened. Which is another trope. You know that one, don't you? Well, that just happened. Here we go again. Lots of catchphrases get, get reused over and over again, repurposed, recycled. Oh, that just happened. Yeah, the, 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 the car crash where the person's going 80 miles an hour, they smash into a telephone pole, they climb out of the car, a little bit concussed, but they walk it off. They're fine after a couple minutes of, usually the camera does like a... Things are foggy, out of focus, blurry, and then it all just like pops into place again because that's how it works that's how it works in the real world <laughs> the last one is the turn on the tv news this is in movies like war of the worlds or really any survival horror movie it's probably in down of the dead a couple times but essentially any key piece of information a hero needs is going to be right there on the television as soon as they walk into a gas station like in um uh, what do we have? A quiet place. They go into the local mart and right there on the back or on the TV or on the radio, right when they walk down the stairs, it says something that's a very important piece of information. Maybe not even for the hero, but for the audience. Like, yeah, they came out of the sky. I saw them and the satellite crashed down. The next thing you know, a monster appears. Okay, well, you just told us that this thing came from space. It's not, it's not earthly by nature. It's from another area, another dimension. We'll get more, I'm sure, as we go into another location. Cloverfield was very good at this. I love how they did it because that's really all the info you got was through TV sets in the background, newspaper articles kind of laying in the debris on the ground, and you had to kind of fill in the gaps. Again, Quiet Place does this to a lesser extent. War of the Worlds does this. But my favorite are really when they're mid-conversation and the guy's like, oh yeah? Well, why didn't you explain this? Turns the TV on and it's exactly what they were talking about. <laughs> the They really make fun of this in a brilliant way in Arrested Development. I think it's season two or three. 
But Michael's having a, a conversation with the attorney and the attorney's like, you guys are screwed. Your dad's been dealing with the terrorists in another country. And Michael's kind of pushing back and the attorney goes, oh yeah? Well, why don't you explain this? And he turns, and I'm paraphrasing, but he turns the TV on and it's a commercial. So they're just sitting there waiting and the guy's like, I mean, the, the story's been on all day. It's going to be on in a second. And after a few minutes, the story comes up and he goes, uh-huh. Now think how impactful that would have been if it came on right when I turned on the TV. That's good commentary. That's good stuff. And that's my commentary and my good stuff on top 10 tropes of mine. And I say top 10 because that's what people say. That's a trope on YouTube to use top 10 in front of anything. Everything's a trope. Nothing's creative anymore. Subscribe to the channel Adam Does Movies for no creativity. But a lot of laughs and fun and heart. And that's really all that matters at the end of the day. No, seriously, thank you for listening and watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your picks for tropes that really bother you, annoy you, or you like, and you're glad they exist to begin with. Maybe it's a camera shot. Maybe it's the, the hero falling to their knees, looking up at the sky and going, no, it happens two or three times alone in the Wolverine, X-Men Origins Wolverine, or also in that movie, the slow motion walk away from the explosion, no looking back. You never look back. That's in about 35,000 movies. Big explosion. Badass dude walking, usually a guitar strum. Mm. I can feel it calling in the air tonight. Okay, we're done here. When, when I start singing, it's officially over. Thanks again. Please think about following me on Spotify or Apple. Let's keep those numbers moving up. And again, I have to I have to say, three podcasts go out every single week on those platforms. I'm excited to build it up over there, get those numbers higher. I'm seeing some good activity. So share it, follow it, like it, tell your mom, tell your dad, tell your deadbeat ex-boyfriend that you don't talk to anymore. Call him up, call her up, say, hey, I know we haven't talked in a long time, but I gotta tell you about Adam Does Movies. He's putting out some really good stuff I think you will like. All right, well, I love you, and I'm glad we had this conversation. Now, I have to run to the store, and I have to go pick up some milk. And on my way there, gets T-boned. We get that side profile shot, gets T-boned, gets out of the car, starts slowly getting up on the road, looks around, gets hit by a bus that they didn't see. Oh my God, we could wrap in every single trope in this final story segment. Wouldn't that be amazing? But no, we're not going to. All right, I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening and watching. Take care. Oh my God. <laughs>